good morning. We are so glad to have you guys here with us today, man. It is a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Bad day of church is better than a good day of jail, amen? So, again, we are. We're so glad you made. If this is your first time here being with us in Lake Country, we want to tell you, you're indeed our special guest here. Do us a favor. There's a card in the seat back in front of you. Grab that card, fill it out, put it in the offering buckets here or in the back on your way out. But just let us know that you made it out here today. And again, we're so glad to have you. And those that are joining us online, so glad to have you guys as well. Um, man, before we dive in to today, I want us to just to pray for a second. Um, we've got our, our students are leaving for youth camp tomorrow. Uh, and all, all the parents said... Amen. Uh, <laughs> and so I do. I want us to just pray over them. And the, the things that just kept stirring in my spirit were just for their safety in that travel up there and back. Uh, but then also for them to receive everything Father has in store for them yeah. while they're there. Um, you know, I spent about 15 years of my life speaking at youth camps and and. Still to this day, I get emails from adults who were students back in the day talking about the, the powerful impact that youth camp had. Because it, it's an incredible time where they can get away from a lot of negative. They, they, they get away from all the screens. And they're focused, man, just on community with each other and community with God. And it's a powerful, powerful time. And so, will you guys just join me in prayer real quick? Father God, in the name of Jesus, we, we lift up our students who are attending camp this next week, leaving tomorrow morning. Father, we, we do pray for your protection. You are a provider. You are a protector. Protect them, Father God. And I pray that the, the youth camp experience wouldn't just start when they arrive. I pray that even on the trip over there, there would be conversations. I pray that your presence would not only protect, but I pray that your presence would be so thick in those vehicles, Jesus, that there would be conversations of you. And Father, when they're there, prepare their hearts and speak loud. I just pray in the name of Jesus Christ, would Jesus mess our students up? Yes. Just mess them up in such a beautiful way. I pray for hurts and wounds that so many of them may be dealing with right now, that you would meet them as healer. Father, I pray for those that are in struggles and battles, I pray you would meet them as warrior. Father, for those that just need your comfort, I pray you would meet them as father and as a comforter. So we lift up our students right now as we send them, Father, and we say be glorified in their lives. And let them come back here and just bring that sweet fragrance of encountering you back with them. We speak this, Lamb of God, in your precious and holy name. And all God's people said, amen, 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 amen. Hey, let me ask you guys, they got your Bibles this morning. You guys got your Bibles with you? you got them? Hold them up, hold them up, hold them up. You got those? All right, good, good, good. Turn over. We're still in the book of Genesis. Turn over into Genesis, and you can... Grab it about chapter 13. We're going to go from 13 to 19 today. Don't get nervous. I got a clock up there. Uh, and if I go long, there's a calendar in the back. So we're good. All right. During the summer months, we have been in a series called Origins. And what we're, we've been doing is we've been looking at the stories inside of the book of Genesis. The word Genesis literally is translated Origins. And so we started off, we had Dr. Canner who was here with us, and Ergen took us through creation. He took us through Adam and Eve in the garden. We started diving in, man. It was, it was so great. Bradley last week, if you missed, Bradley, our youth pastor who was here, brought the word about the Tower of Babel. Incredible, incredible word. Go back online. You can see it on Facebook. You can catch it on YouTube. But he brought the story of the Tower of Babel. We looked at the story of Noah and throughout this series, we've been hitting kind of back and forth with this guy named Abram. And we're going to dive into him real quick while we're here. Let me give you the summary of this guy named Abram. Abram, man, came from pagan household, right? Dad lived in this pagan city, Abram there. He had uh, his nephew Lot who lived there. He's got his wife Sarai. Lived in this pagan city. But God's got his eye on Abram. 
And he's determined, dude, I'm going to work through you. I mean, I want you to picture this. I mean, we're, we're not talking that many you know, years between God's creation and where Abram is right now. And God's going, I'm going to work through you. And so when we start off in, in chapter 13, the whole story begins. We see Abram, we see Sarai, we see his nephew Lot. They leave Egypt and they go south. Now, what's taking place here is that Abram, man, is just being blessed by God. His cattle, his gold, his silver, the scripture talks about it in Genesis chapter 13. It talks about how God has been pouring out and blessing on. Now, let me say this real quick, because that can be such a tricky topic of when we hear about blessings or when we hear about prosperity. And, and, and I want you to hear something. Hear the whole sentence. I believe God wants to prosper his people. Okay? But stay with me. But he wants us to have the character to know what to do with it. I look at each one of my children. I want them blessed of God. I want to see them do well financially with their marriages, with their children. I want to see them do well. But they need to be able to have the character to be able to take hold of those blessings. My sons need the character to know how to be men of God, men who know how to lead, men who know how to protect, men who know how to provide. I don't need my boys, you know, to, <laughs> to be boys who shave. I need men for their wives. When my oldest son, Ben, was four, four, my brother, who doesn't have children, but me and my brother were very adventurous. We were outdoors kids. So for my first son's four-year-old birthday, my brother, who doesn't have kids, brings a gift to the party. I'm excited to see my brother, and I'm nervous to see that gift. And sure enough, my four-year-old son rips open the box, opens it up, and inside is this buck knife. Did we talk about how old this kid was? Yes. So there is this huge, I mean, you open up, it's like, wah. And my son, Ben, I'll never forget this little guy, he's looking at, he looks at me, he's looking at this knife, and he looks at me and he goes, is this for me? And I grabbed the knife and said, not for a while. Why? Because he didn't have the know-all. He didn't have the character. He didn't have the knowledge to be able to handle something like this. So I want you to hear this. I believe God wants to bless you. But he wants you to have the character to know what to do with those blessings. So we see Abram, and Abram is getting blessed of God, and Abram is there with Lot, his, his nephew, right? And they got their cattle, and the scripture tells us that, that Abram is like gold and silver. I mean, he's being blessed of God already. And so when they move down into this area, Lot, he's got all of his cattle, and, and Abram, he's got all of his cattle. Well, they are both being blessed so much, the land can't contain it. And so they talk, and they say, look, man, we got to work this out. And Abram, I love this, me and Pat... Uh, one of our elders here, we were talking about this yesterday, that Abram, the oldest, he should have completely received the honor from his nephew Lot. Lot should have looked at Abram and said, Abram, out of pure honor, he should have looked at him and said, where do you want to go? You choose the land first that you would go. But can I show you something? Here was Abram, man of God, he looks at the younger, he looks at Lot, and he goes, you choose. You choose. Why? Because there was something inside of Abraham that said, my God's going to take care of me. My God is going to take care of me. Abram ended up choosing the land of Canaan, which we will see multiple years later, and uh, we're going to see a little bit of that, uh, was, would be the promised land. Abraham would take that land, Lot, first, he took a portion of land that faced, his tent was faced toward the city of Sodom. And so that's what we see in chapter 13. 
And so as it continues, then what we see, we, we jump down. Chapter 15, what ends up happening is God ends up meeting with Abram at this point, And he gives him a promise. He says, hey, dude, here's the deal. I'm going to work through you, and I'm going to give you more children. You're going to have more descendants than there are. Took him outside. Man, and you know it had to be like a Texas or a Wyoming sky because the stars were just blazing. And he took him out there, and he said, dude, you're going to have more descendants than there are stars in the sky, grains of sand on the ground. Now, this is when you have to walk in faith. Why? Because Abraham was old, his wife was old, and they had no children. But can I just go ahead and tell you this, if you haven't heard it lately, what's impossible with man is not impossible with God. Because now, now folks, you start moving into faith area, all right? So, chapter 16, what we see is this. Sarah, Sarai, the wife, hears from her hubby, hey, we're going to have kids. Hey, we're going to have, Sarah, Sarah, come out. Let me, let me see what this, this guy told me. See those stars? We're going to have more descendants. And she's going... Dude, AARP, are you seeing the card? All right, bro, don't think it's going to be happening. But she heard the promise, and you know what she decided she needed to do? She needed to help God out. Anybody do that? Anybody guilty of that, of like, I got a promise from God, it's not happening, so maybe I need to help God out? Can I tell you something? Never ends well. God is a perfect God, and his timing is perfect. But Sarah, Sarai, decided she needed to help out God. So what she did was she told her husband, she said, listen, maybe God needs some help here. Uh, so why don't you sleep with my servant girl? Her name was Hagar, and let's see if we can get these offspring like the stars you talk about. So sure enough, Hagar becomes pregnant. She has a child. They name the child Ishmael. I told you already, when we try to help God out, it doesn't end well. So who does Ishmael become? Ishmael becomes the father of the Muslim nation. That's chapter 16. But Sarah, still no children. Uh, chapter 17, God comes and he makes a covenant with Abraham. Uh, Abram is now at this point, he is 99 years old. And at this is the point, the name Abram means exalted one. This is the point where God comes, speaks to Abraham and says, dude, I'm going to change your name from Abram, exalted one, and I'm going to change your name to Abraham, the father of many. Can I tell you something right now? For those of y'all who have made the decision, I'm giving my life to God. I'm following Christ. I have received by faith what Jesus has done for me on the cross. Can I tell you something? You're not only a new creation. God's given you a new name. Before, your name was creation. Now, let me say this real quick, because I know the society and world we live in. You'll hear people say, we're all God's children. Can I tell you something? That's not the case. Amen. Listen, uh, some of y'all are going, what? Listen, follow. We're all God's creation. It's when we receive by faith what God has done for us through Jesus Christ on the cross, that we are no longer just his creation. That is when, according to John chapter 1, verse 12, but to as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become sons and daughters of God. Are you all with me on that? There, there, there is a difference. Listen, we're glad you're here at church today. Church ain't going to save you. The message will lead you to the one who will save you. Amen. But if you're sitting here and, and thinking, you know, Scott, there's going to be a day I'm going to die, I'm going to stand before God, and God's going to say, why should I allow you into my kingdom? Please don't say Lake Country Church. It's by Christ and Christ alone. We sang that earlier. So here is Abram, and Abram's now is getting the new name. He is getting the name Abraham. Sarai, she gets a change of name. Her name goes from Sarai to Sarha. Okay, real quick, man, we've been researching this out, and, 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 and me and Dr. J, we, we've had this conversation. The word Sarai, all of a sudden now it's Sarah. What you've got is you've added this H on there in the Hebrew alphabet that H is the breath of God and so now you have got Sarai who is now Sarah and so the breath of God upon this woman now 
Now, also what you're going to see, just real quick, and I'm almost done with summary here, but also what you're going to see is that one more time, God is going to speak to them, and he's going to tell them, you're going to have the son. And I'm sure they're going, oh, we already got the son. It's Ishmael. He's going, no, no, no. That is the son of the flesh. I'm talking about the son of the promise. There is a promise that I gave you that is coming. And so many times we want it today. I want it now. Father God, I'm praying. I'm praying for that blessing. I'm praying for prosperity. I'm praying for patience. I want it now. My time is perfect. And he says, and there's still the son that will come that is the son of promise. Can I say something just real quick? Just real quick. I'm not sure who needs to hear this. Your stupidity is not bigger than God's destiny that he has for you. Because somebody's sitting here going, I'm not good enough. I screwed up here. I'm not good enough because I messed up here. I'm not good enough for the things of God, the promises of God. God says, "Mm -hmm. the destiny I have for you is bigger than your stupidity. Because here was Abraham and Sarah, right? They, got, they go, hey, let's help God out. And they got Ishmael. And God's going, oh, yeah, okay, you missed it. I'm still going to bless you. Man, I hope you grab that today. Okay, that was, that was chapter 17. And they said, you're, you're still going to have this son. His name's going to be Isaac. You know what Isaac means? Laughter. I love that. Because when Sarah heard one more time that she in her old age and my 99-year-old husband, y'all are about to have a kid, all right? We're both going to be in diapers at this point. Uh, but you're going to still have this kid inside. She chuckled. She laughed. And that's what the name Isaac means, laughter. So now we end up in chapter 18. So here's what's taking place. So in chapter 18, Abraham, he's sitting outside when all of a sudden he he sees three men approach him. And this is where we pick up. If you got your Bible still open, look at uh, chapter 18, starting in verse 20. Then the Lord said, okay, this is one of the three. The Lord said... The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin is so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that is reached. If not, I will know. So what God was planning on doing was he knew of the wickedness again. I mean, the time between Noah and already Abraham right now is not a huge gap. But the depravity of man is great and the city was a horrific city we're going to read a little bit here in a second and give you a taste of what this Sodom Sodom and Gomorrah what this place was like but God's intention was I'm going down and I'm going to destroy the city and Abraham pipes up and he goes whoa 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 you're going to destroy the whole city with everybody in it well, what, my Lord, what, what, if, what if you find 50 righteous people in that city? Will you still destroy the city if there's 50 righteous people there? And the Lord says, no. If there's 50, there's 50 righteous people in that city, I'm not destroy it. <laughs> All of a sudden, Abraham starts thinking, huh, I've been to Sodom. What if there's 45? Right? He starts negotiating with God. <laughs> because what if there's 45? God goes, no. Nah, you find 45 righteous people there? No, I won't destroy it. No, good, good. 20? Keeps going. Gets down to 10. I think, I think because this is, this, is, this is a horrific, it's pagan, it's sinful. It, it, God, if there are 10 righteous people there, he goes, if there's 10 righteous people in the city, I'll spare it. Scripture goes on and it says this. Now, chapter 19, starting in verse 1, it says, The two angels arrived in Sodom. Oh, real quick, let me say this. Why, why, was, um, why was Abraham so concerned about the city? Because his nephew was there. Okay? So, yeah, pagan city, horrific place. Abraham was probably going, Yeah, God, seriously, you ought to just scrape that thing. But my nephew's there. And his wife and his two daughters. 
So that's why, that's why Abraham was concerned about the city. So now we focus on these angels now going into Sodom, starting in verse 19. The two angels arrived at Sodom. All right, what happened? Wait, Scott, we had three people. Yeah, we had, if you'll notice what the scripture says, there was the Lord and there were two angels. How do we know it was the Lord? Well, first off, because the scripture says that it was the Lord. What is that? Let me give you your big word for today. It's called a theophany. Theophany is simply this. It's a physical presence of God. All right, so here was God in physical presence, and he's got two angels. At this point, the Lord has already left, and you got two angels left. The two angels arrived, verse 1. The two angels arrived in Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting at the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them. He bowed down with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet, and you can... Now, the angels are about to... They're in the city of Sodom. Lot meets him there, says, come stay with me. They go to his house. While they are in the house, the scripture says that the men of the city, young and old, started surrounding Lot's house. And they were demanding that the two men that they had seen come in, those two angels, they were demanding that those two men be brought out so they could sexually abuse them. Now, for anybody in this room who says, you know, Scott, I just don't read the Bible because it's all these pretty pictures and it's unicorns and everything's perfect. I want you to see, man, that this is, this is the word of God saying that this is, this is the word of God saying this is real life. This is how depraved the city was. In fact, look at what the scripture says in verse 11, chapter 19, verse 11. The angels who were inside... They got everybody outside pounding on the doors. Bring these men out to us. And this is what the angels did. Verse 11. Then they, the angels, struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness, so that they could not find the door. The two men said to Lot, Do you have anyone else here, son-in-laws, sons or daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out because uh, we are going to destroy this place. The outcry of the Lord against the people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. Skip down to verse 17. As soon as they had brought them out, we're talking about, all right, we're talking about Lot, his wife, his two daughters, right? They had... um, um, They were engaged. They got two other guys that they're engaged to. Those guys went, yeah, we don't believe all this. As soon as they brought them out, one of them said, this is the angels talking to that group of people, flee for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. Skip down to verse 23. By the time Lot reached Zor, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the, Lord, uh, from the Lord out of the heavens. Then he overthrew the cities and the entire plains, destroying all the living uh, things in the city and also the vegetation and the land. Verse 26. But Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Inside of Scripture... Inside, inside of the Word of God, right? Inside of this book, there are 170 different women mentioned, either by name or alluded to. 170 different women found in here. There is only one woman that when Jesus was on earth and he spoke, he said, There was one woman, Jesus said, Remember this woman. One. It was Lot's wife. Jesus would speak these words in Luke chapter 17, verse 32. He says simply this, remember Lot's wife. Okay, back in the scripture, chapter 19, verse 26. The only thing that we know about Lot's wife, we don't even have a name for this poor girl. I mean, all she's known as is Lot's wife. And what do we know about her? What do we know about her? That when the angel said, don't look back, that was the one thing she did. She looked back. Now, here, here's what I want you to be able to see. Like I said, the city 
that she was a part of, the city that she lived in, in Sodom, was horrible. It was pagan. It was sinful. It was lustful. You couldn't find ten righteous people inside of that. That's where she lived. That was her life. And then here's what's beautiful. God brought her out. God brought her out of that place. He rescued her out of that city. Can, can I say this real quick? When we look at the story of Lot's wife, what we just read, you know what that is? That's a salvation story. That's a salvation story. We used to live in this old life. This was our old life before you came to Jesus. Man, you thought a certain way. You listened to certain music. You lived life a certain way. But then, praise God, somehow, God brought you out of that old life with the intention of, I'm taking you into this new life. Now, now hear this, because we say this all the time. God doesn't just save us from something. He saves us for something. Are y'all with me on that? And so when we see this picture of God sending this angel, and he's taking Lot's wife, he's taking her out of her past. Isn't that what, isn't that what God did for each one of us? Those of us that are in this room who have made a decision to follow Christ, those of us who have made the decision to say, Jesus, I want to receive that grace by faith, what you've done for me. He took us out of that old life. He took us out of that old world. Now, again, your church story and your salvation story are two different stories. I mean, how you found this church, I've talked to some of you who are like, dude, we're just driving down the street, or with this, we live in the neighborhood, I got a mailer, and okay, great, that's your church story, and we're glad you're here. But see, there's a salvation story. Now, what's funny, <laughs> I grew up, the denomination I grew up in, as a little kid, I remember having these different people come and speak at our church. And some of these people, I remember one time, very first time, we had an ex-bandito motorcycle gang member who had come to Christ, right? And he comes to our church to share. And this guy walks in. Man, he's this big old thick guy and just tatted up. And back then, you didn't see people tatted up. He was tatted up all over. And he gets up there, and he starts talking about, man, all the drugs and people that he's hurt and all this. And as a little kid in church, I'm just like, wow. Wow. I'm saying it backwards. Wow, right? Now, there was, a t <laughs> there was a tendency as a little kid in church to want to hear these gory salvation stories, right? And it, it, I'll be honest, I, I think there got to be a time where there was almost like competition. Who had the gorier story before you came to Jesus? You know, so it'd be somebody like, you know, I drank the hardest liquor, I smoked more drugs than anybody. I was in some of the toughest gangs, but at age seven, I found Jesus and came to Christ. Right? <laughs> Can I tell you something? It's not a competition. Lost is lost. Amen. Sin is sin. Saved is saved. So. When we sit here and we, we, we look at this story of this woman who has come out of her old life, we, we, we hear our salvation stories. There, there is no competition. Jesus took you and me, those of us in this room, those online watching, those who have made the decision to follow Christ. And again, it's not about great men of God. It's about men of a great God. Amen. It's about what Jesus has done for us. He took us out of that old life. That's our salvation story. And that's exactly what happened with this, with this woman, with Lot's, uh, Lot's wife. And when God took them out of the city, he destroyed it. Stay with me. Because when God takes us out of our old life, he wants that destroyed as well. Way too many times, what we can see, we can look at the passage that it will tell us in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, 
He's a brand new creation. Old things are passed away. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. Life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That was my former life. I'm dead to those things. Those things are to be destroyed. And when the angel brought them out, what was the instructions he gave them? He actually, actually gave them two things. When he brought them out of the city, he gave them instructions. Genesis chapter 18, uh, uh, chapter 18, verse 17, do not look back and don't stop anywhere on the plain. Flee to the mountains or you'll be swept away. Two things I want you to see just real quick. Number one is this, flee to the mountain. Can I tell you this? If, if, if you're a new believer in this room, and I say to all of us, flee to the mountain, run to the rock. It's, it's not about coming to church. It's about coming to Christ. We come here to be encouraged. We come here to be challenged. We come here to, to join in and fellowship and community together. We come here to worship together corporately. But my friends, we need to understand this. We need to understand this, is that when we are coming to Christ, we are coming to him, we are walking away from those old things, but we're coming to him. It's not just, well, Scott, I don't smoke dope anymore. Well, Scott, I don't, you know, get thrown in prison like I used to. Well, Scott, I don't beat up people like I used to. Oh, okay, great. But the focus needs to be, but I'm coming to Christ. The focus is, man, I'm growing in love. I'm learning how to worship. I'm getting into the word. That's why the very first thing he said, man, flee to the mountain. Run to God. Run. Flee. Run to God. Psalm 121 verse 1 says this, I lift up my eyes to the mountain. Where does my help come from? God is our refuge. God is our strength. God is our rock, our fortress. Run to him. Second thing he said was this. First thing, man, flee. Run to the mountain. Run to God. Second thing, can we speak this to everybody? Don't look back. Don't look back. Whether it was Boston who sang it or whether it was Bob Dylan, the angel said it first. <laughs> Don't look back. You see, the reality, let me throw this to you. The reality is when we leave our old life, there can be a temptation to want to look back. And whenever there is a temptation to look back, there becomes a stronger urge to walk back. Can I, can I say, if you're a new believer in this room, can I say this to you just real quick? There needs to be a cutting of the umbilical cord, of your connection, lust, and desires and practices of your old life. That's who you were. That's not who you are today. And so somewhere along the way, there needs to be that severing. There needs to be that cutting. There needs to be that release. In fact, can I give you this real quick? Do y'all remember when we were talking about earlier, we were doing the review of Abram, Abraham, and God gave him a covenant. All right, well, the covenant Part of the covenant was this. This is where they introduced circumcision, right? And if you're here and you're young and you're going, what's circumcision? Ask mom and dad after lunch. Um, but just to simply give you this, give you this, right? It's a cutting. It's a cutting. And when we leave our old life, there needs to be a cutting of our old life. Because there will be that temptation, my friend, to be able to look back. Now, for those who... Um, those who used to be, those who are maybe new in a relationship with Christ, there can be, like I said, that temptation of thinking back to your back life, which can lead to looking back, which can lead to walking back. So there was a Spanish conquistador named Cortez. And in 1519, Cortez uh, from Spain came and landed here. 1519 came and landed here in the New World. And his desire, his goal, his command was to be able to bring in large amounts of wealth here in the New World. It was to conquer new territories. It was to make a name for himself. Now, Cortez knew that this was not going to be an easy task. 
He brought a ship over full of his men, about 600 men. He knew this was not going to be an easy task. He knew there would be times it would be difficult. He knew there would be times when they would get weary. He knew that there would be times where they would be tempted to want to just throw it away and let's just go back. So what did Cortez do? He lit the ships on fire. And every one of those men that were there realized this. There's no going back. There's no going back. And I even wonder this today. I wonder how many of us in this room have ships that we need to set on fire. He said two things. He said, run to the mountain. He said, to don't look back. Now, let me hit this real quick. We're going to finish. When I talk about this, when I talk about um, God bringing us out, it's not just our salvation story. Because when God spoke to Lot's wife and said, don't look back, and then Jesus is going to say this. Jesus is going to say, remember this woman. Well, when Jesus spoke that, he, he knew there would be a temptation. The angel of the Lord, here it is. The angel of the Lord said, don't look back at what I'm about to burn down. Don't look back at what I am finished with in your life. Don't look back at the thing that I am delivering you from. Don't look back, look forward. But Lot's wife didn't heed that. And her desire, her attention was looking back and she calcified right there where she was. Can I tell you something? She never moved into what God had in store for her. And how many of us in this place here today, God is saying this, quit looking back. You got some hurts, you got some wounds, you got some things back there. Stop looking back. Because you're going to calcify right there where you are, and you're not going to move into what I have in store for you. I'll tell you this. If you're new here today, again, welcome. You're at a pretty incredible church. This Lake Country Church has a fantastic history, incredible history. It's over 46 years old, and I've spent time with multiple people in this, this church, and they've told me the stories of great movements of God that have taken place in this, in this house. Talking about how Jim Hilton would travel across the United States and be a part of great movements of where God was moving. Then he would bring these stories home and begin to share with the people here. And man, the stirrings that would take place, the revival services that would take place, the healings that would take place, the way that God's presence would drop like it did in 1987 or like it did in 92 or back in 205. Some incredible things would happen. And if we're not careful, there can be a temptation to say, God, do it again like you did in 87. Do it again like you did in 2005. In the Old Testament, many times after God would give a victory to the children of Israel in Babel, or do something miraculous. He would say this, build an altar. Right? So when I say an altar, I want you to picture just a big stone table. And the purpose of that, according to Scripture, was that when the kids would be outside playing, right? Maybe you got a kid, he's out there, you got... He's out there, he's mowing the lawn, and all of a sudden he comes to this big pile of stones. And he's like, Dad, what is this about? And Dad was able to go, oh, yeah. Son, did I ever tell you the story how God delivered us? And that altar would be there to remember what God had done. Now, I want you to hear something. What God did in 87, what God did in, in 92, what God did in 2005, praise God. 
I want to remember those things. I want to honor those things. I want to honor Pastor Jesse. I want to honor Jim Hilton. Raz, those of y'all who don't know, one of the other just leaders of this church just graduated to heaven last night. I celebrate what those men have done. But I'm not going to live in the past. Because I'm hungry for what God wants to do now. church do you think God wants to move powerfully again like he did in 87 like he did in 92 like he did in 2005 do you think God wants to move powerfully again but what if it's not the same way what if what if it's in a different way those of y'all that saw the movie, The Jesus Revolution, we, we, in fact, we, we, we took our whole church to it, right? We rented a theater and we went there. We had church that night. That was fun. To look at that and I look at that and say, God, would you move like that again? In our city, in EMS, would, would you, in this church, will you move powerfully God, how do you want me to move? Uh -uh. Your will be done. Because God, you may do something totally different than you did in 92. Something totally different than you did in 2005. Listen to me. I'm going to remember what God did back then. I'm not going to live there. Because God is up to something now. And that's why in his spirit, he speaks to every one of us and he says it. Celebrate me, be encouraged for what I've done, but be hungry for what I'm doing.